Welcome to the Screen the Screener College Basketball Podcast with your hosts, Mike Randall and Gus Kearns. Welcome in listeners to the Screen the Screener College Basketball Podcast, where we're always talking everything college hoops. You could have been anywhere else on the dial, but you chose to be here with us, Mike and Gus. And that's right, both of us are here tonight, so we thank you for that. And Mike, I'm just going to say, are you getting ready for the holiday season? How's everything going over there? Everything is great. Fantasy football is winding down. I have two fantasy football championship games to deal with, one in my big money league with the Action Network guys, so I'm very excited about that. Only me, Gus, only could I find a way to potentially lose this. I have Lamar Jackson, Chris. Christian McCaffrey, Zach Ertz, great team. And it's the big money league, so we hope we come out on top there. And, of course, college basketball is rolling, so very excited here. Fantasy football, rearview mirror, and then college basketball 24-7. It looks like it's a beautiful forecast coming forward, even though we had a winter squall here on the uh, e- on the East Coast of New Jersey. It, it was like Yeah, winter squall. Terrible. I'll tell you what I'm doing in a winter squall. Got out of work early. <laughs> And I right. went and I got cupcakes last night. I had a bunch of work events and I brought cupcakes home. But clearly, I did not bring my son the right cupcake. He wanted a Spider-Man cupcake. So I figured, <laughs> oh, I'll get out of work a little early. I'll just go. I'll pick up the cupcake. I'll be home. I get nailed in the summer squall. It's like an hour and a half to get a cupcake in Ridgewood. It's unbelievable. But whatever. We made it through. The, the squall was really interesting because it has like zero visibility. It, it drops like, you know, a, co- a coating of snow everywhere. And then it just wreaks mayhem on any sort of transport or transportation when you're trying to get anywhere. The, uh, the Liberty defense of weather is what it is, yes. Excellent reference. Excellent. Un- undefeated Liberty. They are. All right, so uh, listeners, we're going to ask for a couple of pleases right up front. We're going to ask for, uh, hey, don't forget to give the podcast a follow. At SDS Podcast, Efficiency of Keystrokes, of course. Please don't forget to give Mike a follow at Randall Rant. He is insightful, educational, of course, entertaining. And uh, if you like what you're listening to, Go to your podcast vehicle of choice. Go ahead, rate, review. We're at 150 reviews. We're looking to get a little bit closer to 200. And, you know, we, we did this in the past, and we can throw it out again. Like, you know, you leave a nice review. We'll give you a shout-out on the pod, just like, uh, you know, the CBS does and everybody else does. Uh, I, I feel like we might have influenced them in doing that. So I like to think that we have, a, a, like, slight influence on the college basketball landscape. And... uh I think what we need to do is get into the holiday spirit, right, Mike? I think we need, I need to talk like some holiday type, I don't know, it's a holiday type type of topics. And let's see where that takes us. Uh, Mike, do you want to talk about some joyful things to start off with? Because it is a joyful time of year. It's a very joyful time of year. I am very happy and very joyous for San Diego State. The, there we go. The Aztecs, they're very different this year. They're not just your ho-hum, Mountain West, overrated, get one team in. They lose in the first round by 15 in the NCAA tournament. I think they're legit. They have two quadrant one wins. They won at BYU. No child's there. They beat Creighton. They beat Iowa and Vegas. Brian Dutcher doing a fantastic job. They're always great defensively. They're 26 in adjusted defensive efficiency. That's their calling card. Uh, and they're holding opponents at 26.9% from three-point range, but they're also great on offense this year. Very efficient. I'm buying in. Normally, we see these teams, we just ignore them. My vibe is that the Aztecs are going to be legit. I like the way they play. They're sort of little positionless, if you will. Switch a lot of stuff. They're big inside. have the big guy inside as well. So very impressive. Very joyous for San Diego State. And the other team I'm joyous of, and I've said this all year, I think Mm -hmm. BYU is the best team in the WCC. Now, all roads go through Gonzaga. Gonzaga is the dominant team. They win it every year. Kansas in the Big 12, Gonzaga in the WCC. I get it. I'm telling you, this team is different. On January 18th, they travel to Gonzaga. Ken Palm has Gonzaga by nine. February 22nd, they host Gonzaga. Ken Palm has it, Gonzaga winning by two. So the metrics line up that it's going to be a close game. They have the best player in the conference. He was the preseason conference player of the year in Yoeli Childs. He is a load inside. They won at Houston without Childs. They dropped 90 and beat Virginia Tech two games after Vatek destroyed Michigan State and Hawaii. They did lose a true row game in Utah in OT. That's a very tough place to play. It's a rivalry game. They did lead for most of the game, and it was Child's first game back. Oh, by the way, he had 29 points in 25 minutes against Utah in that game. They beat Nevada by 35 at home. That's my token Nevada reference. They beat a fully stocked Utah State team with Keita, 68-64. And here's the thing. 
When BYU plays Gonzaga, this is what you're going to see. Gonzaga does not defend the three well. You can see it tonight how North Carolina, who is decimated right now, is nowhere near a top 25 team, is still, to quote John Malkovic, hanging around in the game. They don't defend mm-hmm. the three well. BYU shoots it lights out. I think Childs is an issue inside, and I think BYU is really, really good. So the two teams that I'm joyous about that have kind of popped off the page to me are San Diego State and BYU. I think they're a lot better than I thought they would be at the beginning of the year. Well, I, I, I'm with you on San Diego State. And we talked about this with uh, Jeff Nadu, a big man on campus. He liked them as well. Great interview, by the way. Th- fantastic interview. <laughs> he was fantastic. I didn't know I didn't know what we were getting ourselves into. And it was just like really enjoyable. And he was unbelievably knowledgeable. So it was, it was really pleasant. Uh, you know, shout out to Jeff. That was a, a great. Thank you so much, Jeff. We appreciate it. If you're not following him, go give him a follow at Jeff Nadu, capital J, capital N. He does a great job handicapping and just with college hoops in general. Uh, so I'm with you. I think Matt Mitchell has been there forever. He's got kind of one of those guys. He's like, he's still there. Yeah. And they, of course, have brought in a bunch of transfers. Like you mentioned, they're a little positionless. They have shooters that can, you know, stretch the floor a little bit that complement that lockdown defense that you referenced earlier. And I'm going to tell you right now, BYU, I'm a little bit in. I think once they got integrate childs appropriately, and it seems like he's appropriately integrated with 29 points in 24, 25 minutes. And the fact that he outplayed Keita, I know Keita is still dealing with some injury problems in that Utah State matchup. They have shooters that are going to stretch the floor. I think that's going to be a really interesting battle of offensive philosophies when that comes to January 18th and February 22nd. And look, the team that I'm really joyful for is the team that you referenced. I'm joyful for Gonzaga. They're, they're, they lose four starters to the NBA, no problem. We'll just go knock off Washington. We'll walk, we'll knock off Oregon. We'll knock off Arizona. And we'll just like, you know, dominate the Pac-12. The transfer backcourt is doing just enough with Gilder and Woolridge. Woolridge seems like one of the fastest players in college basketball with the ball. I know where I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, but he remi- his speed reminds me of like the Aaron Fox's like type of speed with the ball. He's not as creative and he's not, you know, obviously as athletically gifted. But he does have a very big change of pace that's noticeable when he has the ball. And Gilder, when he's open, and when, by the way, when is he not open, is going to shoot it and, and most likely make it from three. The international flair is there. Joel Ayayi is getting better game by game. Philip Petrusev, one of the best players that you don't know yet. He is their next big post player. The old hands, Corey Kispert and Killian Tilly, are ridiculously versatile on the offensive end. And keep an eye on Drew Timmy. We talked about Drew Timmy with Jackson Frank. He's a freshman that's going to impact the game on both ends. He does not play a ton of minutes, so he's going to absorb some of that defensive responsibility, use up his fouls, and he's going to be a pain in the tuchus in the post. Plus, he was one of those coaches that figures it out every year, just like Coach Painter, just like Coach Beard, just like Coach Wright. He figures it out every year regardless of the roster. So I'm I'm a little joyful about Gonzaga, and I think that uh, that those games, January 18th and February 22nd, those are games are marked down on the calendar for sure. Listen, Gonzaga obviously is the favorite. I'm not a fool here. I know the Gonzaga fans are going to think I'm a foil. But when they had their undefeated season, they did lose at home to BYU on senior night. Correct. And the last game that they lost, albeit two years ago, at home was to St. Mary's with Jock Landell, where you and I went back and forth and I jumped off the St. Right. Mary's train. What I'm saying is... Gonzaga is going. They could win the national championship. This view is one of the no, no, no view is one of the no best doubt. coaches in the country. He always maximizes his talent. Now I look at this team. I I don't see dominant talent like. I, Tilly is the Euro big, right? He shoots the threes. He's very fragile, always gets hurt, and I, I, he doesn't have the mass. Like, you would think a guy who wants to play in the NBA, he is he's no definition whatsoever. Kispert is 6'7", 220, great outside shooter, can take bigs off the dribble, foul on extended trailer, that sort of thing. But if he's matched up with an athletic guy, I think he's going to be contained. He's a little Luke Mayish, if you will, kind of, sort of. But great comparison. Ayayi has been fantastic, super impressed with him. Admon Gilder was not a great player at Texas A&M, and now all of a sudden he comes to Few, and View does the old, these not the droids you're looking for, routine. Now all of a sudden he's like, you know, fantastic. So in a year where the top teams are not dominant, 
I see a lot of greatness coming out of Gonzaga. I just think a team that's going to stick it to Gonzaga is going to have to be one that is used to them, that has seen their style, and that is comfortable there. It's very tough to beat Gonzaga. It's very tough to beat Kansas in the Big 12. It's very tough to beat Virginia and Duke in the ACC. But if someone's going to do it, I think BYU has the components that could give them a real trouble, you know, especially at home. Listen, I'm with you, and we saw what happened with Michigan. It's not crazy for this to happen. And if we just look at the overall landscape of where college basketball is right now, and we talked about this a little bit on previous podcasts, Mike, we go back and look at Ken Palm's efficiency numbers and his metric that you know everybody uses as a crutch, but it really it's, it's great for references like this. Ohio State still has the highest efficiency margin number this season, even with taking the loss to, to Minnesota on the road. Their number is at 27 and change. Okay. And if we just go back and look at previous years, the best teams in the country are over 30, 32, 36, that Kentucky year. So even the best team in the country by metrics this year is flawed and a little bit lesser than the great teams from years past. So look, as, as much as, as much as we want to like, you know, uh, celebrate like all these upsets, it seems like there's fallacies all over college basketball and there's limitations and every, everybody has warts. And if a team like Gonzaga can be in the conversation for a national championship after losing four starters, I think that speaks to the culture there. And also, it also speaks to like, you know, any, anybody's guess is good enough at this point. Like, you, you want to try to figure this out? Good luck. I could see it being... Great coaches like Few and Shashevsky make the final right. four again because yep. the 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 range there has has lessened. Or I could see it totally being a crazy tournament where we got like four <laughs> non one seeds. Um, but you're going to beat these teams. You're going to have to earn it, and you're going to have to play a style that beats them. So if you're going to beat Gonzaga, you got to make threes because they're going to score. They're going to score up and down. I mean, they pounded Arizona. Forget yep. that the end of the game was crazy. They pounded them. So right. you have to have the right schematic, is what I'm saying. And and it's difficult because you don't see Gonzaga regularly, you're going to struggle. Take a look at Texas A&M. What happened to them? Uh, and then the other team I'm really joyous for is Auburn. I think they have embraced the three-point concept and the philosophy of like, hey, let's trade two for threes. But if you take a closer look at the team this year, their two-point shooting is through the roof. They have, uh, and I mean, they have a Coral like, doing stuff. They have a Wiley shooting great from two-point range. So not only are they still going to be married to and, and, and follow that, like, let's get three point shots up philosophy. Their bigs are shooting twos at an unbelievable rate and being really efficient. So they have the option of, you know, spreading the floor with their three point shooters and they're going to be, you know, they're committed to, to getting X amount of three point shots up. But I'll tell you right now, they're very similar to Gonzaga where their, their bigs are going to be really efficient inside. And if you want to compare that, 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 that sounds about right. But this Auburn team, after getting a run to the Final Four and losing their starting backcourt, it's a very similar profile to the Bulldogs where, hmm, I didn't think they'd be here undefeated. And I didn't think they would be making noise. And I didn't think they'd be playing this effectively, playing a little different style with getting their bigs and shooting that amount of twos and being really efficient and playing into their strengths. Yeah, and it's going to be interesting with Auburn. Pearl's done a fantastic job. This team is not unbelievable. Job. This team is not shooting threes well, and it started to catch up with them a little bit. They they were right. they had a trouble with Richmond, who's very good this year in a neutral court. They barely beat Furman. R- 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 Richmond's nine and one. Coach Mooney's doing a great job. Right. They barely beat Furman at home in an overtime game, and then St. Louis came in and covered. Thank you very much in a semi home <laughs> nice. game there. So. They have not been blowing teams out at home. I'm concerned if they don't get their threes going that they're not going to be able to dominate within the conference there in the SEC. But I do Mm. give kudos to him that he's transitioned this team from run and gun with Brown and Harper and fire up to threes to basically inside guys, like you said, 10th most efficient from two-point percentage in the nation. Yeah, there you go. That speaks to it right there. That number absolutely tells what the change of philosophy year-to-year Coach Pearl one of the most underrated coaches in the country. Great job at Auburn. All right, Mike. <laughs> one of the things that often gets brought up around holiday time is like the coal in the stocking thing, right? If you you know you're on the naughty list, you get the coal in the stocking, or you can use that as a threat with your with your children. Like you know, you better you better do your homework, otherwise we get coal in the stocking. You better uh, like you better be listening to your teachers in school, or you do the coal in the stocking, or you better go clean up your room. That type of situation. I felt like Jaron Cumberland from Cincinnati in that in game situation. 
where he just like chucked the half court shot with five seconds to go. And then you look at the, you look at the Cincinnati bench and they're all holding up their hands. Did, did, did Jaron Cumberland get some early coal in his stocking there? Like I couldn't understand that end game situation. I mean, I picked him as like, you know, whatever, a second team all America preseason and he looks unbelievably ordinary and totally like disinterested in college basketball on the whole. Like, I think Jaron Cumberland might have gotten a little coal in the stocking early on. Yeah, maybe he struggled to adjust here uh, under Brandon and the new coach. But Cumberland was a guy we were really excited about. Senior, yeah. he's averaging 13 points per game. That's okay, but it's down from 18 last year. And you would think he's right. freed from the chains of Mick Cronin, right? Now, listen, tonight they did beat Tennessee at home, which was a nice one. They're now 7-4, and 5-1 and one at home. But it was one of these games where they had six guys in double figures. Cumberland had 10 ho-hum. That that was a bizarre game. It was a terrible loss to Colgate. Kudos to Colgate for that win. Cumberland was benched for one game this year because of some conduct detrimental to the team. So he's definitely a Cole guy. It's a great pick because he has not nearly a pre- he's not nearly performed where we thought he would be. Not even close. Mike, is there somebody that you feel like or a team or or some program where they might have gotten a little coal in their stocking a little bit early this year so far? Yeah, I think Providence stinks. I, and, I, and I am <laughs> shocked about this because I was very high on Providence coming into the right. year. They are six and six with some just mind head scratching results. They lost at Northwestern after Northwestern had two terrible performances there. They lose at Northwestern by nine. Okay, they bounce back. St. Peter's, Merrimack, fantastic. Lose at home to Penn. And here's the deal. We can go back and forth about there's no shame in losing the Ivy. The Ivy is tough. That's fine. If you're Providence and you're a team that you have aspirations of being a dark horse and winning the Big East, you can't lose at home to Penn. I don't care if Penn is Michael Jordan on it. It's still Penn. You have to win that game. All right? If Duke loses to Penn, it's not – you know, there's there's a level – and I thought Providence was in that level. They lost to Long Beach State on a semi-neutral. Charleston, they lost in a neutral. So three losses in a row. Okay, we'll be Pepperdine barely by three. Then they go to Rhode Island. Thank you for that. It was an easy one. Battle Rhode Island, they get smacked around. Stony right. Brook barely. We watched that game, my wife and I. Stony Brook was in that yep. game the entire time. They lost by Stony Stony Brook played uh, UVA yeah, and they well. covered and they covered. They also hit the under. By the way, death taxes in the under in Virginia games. I think they're like <laughs> nine and one this year and under something like that. It's phenomenal. Uh, and then Florida, they got their doors blown off. Terrible performance by Cooley. Alpha Diallo, you talked about him. I love him. They're playing no defense whatsoever. Too many turnovers. Throwing the ball all over the place. And look, I can make a case, Gus. If you look at the Big East, I can make you an argument right now. They're the worst team in the Big East. You ready? Seton Hall. Okay, get all right. All right, all right make your Seton case. Seton Hall, ahead. Villanova, Xavier, Marquette. I don't think anybody's arguing with them. Georgetown's on fire. They only have seven scholarship players. But, and listen, I understand the Ewing effect. Ironic that's Georgetown. It's funny. You talked about that right, with Greg yeah. Peterson. But yes, right. I, I, ironic. But they've been playing well. So I can't tell you that Providence is better than Georgetown until Georgetown finally cools off, which they haven't. Creighton, no way. Butler, forget it. DePaul, of course, it is really good. We know the Paul. So the question is, who's better, Providence or St. John's? Is that really the, the question that we're talking about? If that's the case, it's a disappointment. Cole and Ed Cooley stocking. Terrible job. Wow. Uh, and, and look, when we talked to Matt Norlander preseason, he talked about like Providence being one of his like sleeper teams, which is crazy. Yeah. Well, they're sleeping all right. That- they're just, they're just <laughs> Rip Van Winkle. All right. So uh, let, how about, you know, you guys get like that surprise gift. Uh, maybe it's, it's a surprise who it came from. Like the origin of your gift. And you're like, oh, wow, that's really nice that that person or that family or whoever that is just thought of us during the holiday season. Or maybe you get a gift where you're like, oh, wow, I didn't know that that was going to happen. It's like the sneaky surprise gift of the, you know, of the season. So I I have a couple of sneaky surprise gifts for the season. I think I'll go players first. Uh, How about Jordan Rowland from Northeastern? He started the season by absolutely destroying my, my preseason final four pick Harvard and, 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 you know, dropped 42 on them, uh, early on this season. And just listen to these numbers from Jordan Rowland from Northeastern. He's averaging 25 points a game. He's shooting 55% from the field. He's shooting 46% from three, 92% from the line. And his true shooting percentage currently right now is sitting at over 70%. This is absolutely bananas, fruitcake, holiday-type stuff. And I, the CAA is legit. And Jordan Rowland, we, we talked about. I, I can't believe we didn't talk about this with Brian Moe when we talked about the CAA. We didn't talk jo- Jordan Rowland at all. And he's just blowing things up right now in college basketball. And uh, we mentioned Butler just previously. And Kamar Baldwin is my other guy. Sneaky gift. Another guard that you need to include in the in the All-America conversation along with Peyton Pritchard. Butler has been absolutely wonderful 
They play a certain type of pace and they value possessions. And, and Butler makes the most of those possessions. And Baldwin is the guy that finishes those possessions more often than not when the shot clock gets down to zeros. Think about the guard play inside the Big East this year with Powell. I know Powell's injured currently to Howard, Baldwin, McClung. You mentioned Georgetown. He's been balling out. There's a lot of nba talent here, Mike. So, Mike, do you have a sneaky surprise gift for the holiday season with a player that maybe you're like, oh, wow. I didn't expect that to happen. That's a nice surprise. I mean, I always am going to joke about somebody's going to be Kansas, and of course, it finally happened. But I am surprised about how well Jared Butler has played. Sophomore 6'3", 190 down in Baylor, 17 points, 46% from the field, 44% from three-point range. He's had some major, major games, 22 against Villanova, played very well, struggled against Butler, but they did get the win in that game. So I am very impressed with him and Baylor. You know, in the preseason, everyone was talking about Tristan Clark. No one really talked about Butler. He's taken a huge leap forward. Great point. 90% from the free throw line, which is going to be important in Baylor games because they're going to keep it low usually. So fantastic job by him with Scott Drew. Fantastic. The other one, too, is I wasn't really buying in on Memphis. I mean, you know, again, my my ah. my bend is, okay, you have a lot of players and they're great and we hear how great they are. And then they're Kwame Brown. Okay, so I, I like I just because you hear about them doesn't mean that they're, you know, just because everyone has a five star doesn't mean they're, they're going to be good. There's a lot of five stars who stink. So I wanted to see what Penny was going to do. I wanted to see how legit he was going to be. James Wiseman's been out. Since then, Precious Achua has been fantastic. I saw him against Mississippi. He played well. He's an athletic big. He can get down the floor. He reminds me a ton of Carl Anthony Towns. The same type of game that he plays. Gets, gets to the block. Great up and under moves. Really active. Athletic. Really has impressed me. And I think he went very under the radar because of Wiseman. 13.3 points. 10 boards. That's a double-double. He gets 1.6 steals and 1. 1. 1.2 steals, 1.6 blocks. That's the type mm-hmm. of player that we're talking about there. So very excited about him. He's really held the line there with Wiseman being out. I think he is absolutely going to be a lottery pick this year. I'm calling it now. Very active wow. guy. Going to be a solid pro. So two guys that I thought maybe were a notch below that they were, but have really impressed me so far. Memphis hasn't lost a beat since Wiseman's been out. Surprise gifts of the holiday season include Jordan Rowland, Kamar Baldwin, Jared Butler, who we talked about with Russell Hayline from uh, Seconds to Madness podcast. He also brought him up, so it's a great reference right there. And of course, Precious Chua. Mike, I'm going to put you on the spot here. You you referenced the cat uh, you know, comparison there. Do you think that he has a, a shot potential? Because, you know, Carl Anthony Towns is like one of the best shooting big men that we have in the NBA right now. He, he is not afraid to put it up from 30 feet. Do you see that progression or that, uh, I, I guess that advancement in his game? where he can shoot it as well as Towns? I will tell you this. I, Towns was getting like eight points per game at Kentucky that year because I remember we talked about him. And then he got in the NC tournament right. and went bananas. Okay? Right. Crazy. Precious Achua around the basket, around the sort of, you know, we all used to play around the world. Around that area, his running one-handers, his short step, the putback, the touch is just as good as Carl Anthony Towns. Now, can he, okay. can he step out? I have no idea. He certainly hasn't shown it so far. But let me see it. I will tell tell you his touch around the basket is fantastic and he runs the floor as well as any big man in the country the double doubles have been impressive since the mississippi game 11 11 14 11 13 rebounds he's dominating inside wiseman comes back you're going to see him freed up a little bit so i know it's early but let's forget that before cat and those guys they weren't dropping 28 points this early in the season right i mean uh, devin booker was coming off the bench but yes i like what i see with him his touch is tremendous and very impressive. They just make free throws, Gus. Memphis can absolutely make a Final Four. Okay, there's a lot of things to go with there. I like that. I, I, I'm, here's what I'm going to say. I agree with you completely. His feel and his touch around the basket is really impressive. Yeah. No doubt there. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you're spot on right there. And you just want to see if that can extend out to the elbow, to the elbow extended, to the college three-point line, and, and then so on. So you want to see if that's that's an advancement he can make in his game. I'm going to go with one other like little surprise, uh, one other like gift that you didn't expect. I'm going to go with the team. I'm going to go with Duquesne. They're one of the Playing lone great. undefeated teams remaining in the sport. Give the Dukes a little credit here. Here's the crazy, powder, crazy part about the Dukes, right? Their best player from the roster last year, Eric Williams, who's like a kind of do-everything wing, is now competing against Peyton Pritchard 
and the Ducks on their practice squad because he transferred out and is sitting out the year after averaging close to 15 points a game last year for the Dukes. The engine of this Duquesne team is sophomore point guard Sincere Carey. He's averaging 12 points, five assists a game, shooting it over 40% from three. It's just another team that looks dangerous inside a very underrated A-10, and I think Duquesne is going to kind of keep things rolling, and they're not going to be intimidated by any of the teams, whether it be VCU, whether it be Davidson, whether it be Rhode Island. I don't think that they're going to, like, I don't think they're going to blink when they face any of those teams. Duquesne, nice, beautiful, surprise gift when you unwrap it. Oh, look at that. It's an undefeated team in college basketball amongst every upset everywhere. So cheers, Duquesne. Go Dukes. Duquesne's been fantastic. The one I also like, I'm going to give him kudos tonight, East Tennessee State. How about Steve Forbes? There it is. How about Steve Forbes doing what he does there in the SoCon? Yep. We know you, you know we love the SoCon here. Had a nice battle down in Kansas, but came up short. They got tripped up away at North Dakota State, and they pounded LSU tonight, 74-63. So love East Tennessee State. They're always going to kill you on the boards. They're top 20 in offensive rebounding percentage. They're great from three-point range as well. Great job. The next great SoCon team. You know, East Tennessee State's always good good. Last year, they were kind of buried a little bit by everything that went on with Wofford and Furman. I get that. Yep. But this year, they may be coming back here like Chubb Rock. Love East Tennessee State with Steve Forbes. Excellent comparison. Uh, excellent shout out there. We talked about East Tennessee State when we had uh, Brian Mull on the podcast. We talked some SoCon. So we were we were kind of on them uh, and discussed them, but not nearly enough, obviously, after that game. Okay. Uh, Mike, I don't know if you're involved with this, um, but we'll go with uh, the elf on the shelf. I, I, I know with, you know, if you have kids in the car, just fast forward to the next 15 seconds. It, it, it's really, it's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of pressure every day. Uh, but you need to keep track of that elf every day. So what we're going to do here is who's a player that you need to keep a track, keep track of every game, every box score, and you need to check in on them or at least view them if you know that they're on. I think the first player for me has to be, you know, we're going to obviously we'll go very generic here, but we'll go Obi Toppin. I think if you don't, if you have an opportunity to view the, the, the forward, the wing from, from Dayton, go ahead and do it because he's going to be an NBA lottery pick. You mentioned, uh, you know, pressure to chew and might, might, might approach that status as well. He's banging threes from everywhere. He's dunking on people on spin moves and he is unbelievable and Dayton is really dangerous. However, I think along with Obi Toppin, he's one of those guys you want to check the box where you want to see what he did, you want to see what Dayton did, and if you can view them, you want to pull them up. How about Aaron Nesmith from Van? He's been fantastic with Stack, absolutely. He's made 37 threes so far for Coach Stackhouse in the comms. He dropped 34 on Richmond, who we mentioned earlier, already this season. The 6'6 wing is averaging over 22 points a game on like crazy shooting numbers, maybe not like Jordan Rowland area, but still really great. Over 43% from the field, 48% from three. And that equates to a true shooting percentage of near 65%. Now, he isn't the best ball mover and best passer, but his NBA-sized frame with that attracting shooting numbers really give Vandy what they thought they were going to have last year with like Darius Garland, like a game-changing player with an NBA future waiting. And I think that NBA eyes are taking, are taking notice and there's going to be a couple more scouts at Vandy games coming up because he's just balling out and playing unbelievably well. So he's a guy that I have on my like kind of elf on the shelf look where you got to like keep track of him and make sure he's on your radar uh, to make sure that he did he go off again? Did he go off for another 30 points? Did he make seven threes again? The, the, the guy is one of the best shooters in college basketball that nobody's talking about. Yeah, this, the elf on the shelf. I have mixed emotions about part of it. I like, I like, right? I love it. I love that part. The kids, the whole thing. Okay, so the guy that I love, the part of the elf on the shelf I love that I'm going to go to is Anthony Cowan. I think Anthony Cowan is as valuable to his team in Maryland as any player in the nation. I'll explain that. I think they overcome some questionable coaching from Turgeon. You know, we've always said that about Turgeon. He right. is the straw that stirs the drink. Anthony Cowan, sixteen and a half points, three point seven boards. 4.3 assists, 1.4 steals, 74% from the line, 38% three-point range. He gets milk. He kisses babies. He shakes hands. He does it all. <laughs> he is the guy. If you take Anthony Cowan off that team, obviously they lose to Illinois, okay? But uh, you take Anthony Cowan off the team, it changes the dynamic. I love watching him play. He's got it. He's got that. I'll take the shot. Don't worry about it. I'll make it Jimmy Chipwood here. So I love Anthony Cowan. I can't stop watching him. Now, the part of the elf on the shelf that I hate... You always got to remember, I wake up middle of the night, 
shoot, hon, I didn't move it. Okay, the whole thing, all that stuff. The, totally. the one that I am sort of just watching here is, can we relax about Tyrese Maxey? Okay. Just like last year when, uh, what's his name on Kansas? He's now in Houston. Uh, Quentin Grimes. Sorry, Quentin Grimes. He's not a leading scorer for Houston. There's the guy. So Tyrese Maxey, we loved him, dropped all those points. Fantastic. Now we're looking at Kentucky team, by the way, who's playing in a neutral in Vegas against Utah tonight. Can't wait to watch that game. Tyrese Maxey, last three games against UAB, FDU, and Georgia Tech. By the way, not exactly murderer's row, Gus. Seven, two, and six. Okay. So can we, I want to see him because I want to see, were we wrong about him? Is he going to come back again or is this going to be, is this going to be Quentin Grimes Rita? Okay, so Cal will get it right. We know he will. Right. They're Sweet 16 every single year, but they need a lead guy. They're better when they have Malik Monk dropping 50. They're better when they have Swipe of the Fox there, greater than Lonzo Ball, uh, but when they have those type of players. So Max, he's got to be that guy, but I haven't seen it yet, Gus. So just like the elf on the shelf drives me a little nuts, so does Maxi because we're all waxing nostalgic on him, and now all of a sudden he's on the side of a milk carton. Just saying. That's a fantastic elf on the shelf. How about, uh, all right, so you guys know that we get one of those lame gifts. It's an overrated present that you fake interest in after opening, like one of those oddly scented candles that might be wrapped, like very similar to a, a can of craft beer, and you might be excited about that, and then you're like, oh, man, this is just a candle? And I think the two teams that we go with here are very simple. I think we go with you know the, the game that we're kind of following now via podcast, uh, is, is UNC. Gonzaga pulling away from my uh, five in-game wagers on that game, by the way, I guess. Five in-game wagers on Gonzaga. I got 23 right now. Go ahead. Is, is there, is there a way we can take the over on your in-game wagers? Yeah, I, this that, one, I, that... it's one of those things, you know, like I, I took it, I took it when it came out last night. It was minus 10. I right. started laughing. Okay. Then it got up to 12. I said, I'm going to punch it again. And then today, yep. and then today it was like in-game 12, 13, 4. I'm just keep hitting it. I'm hitting it like Planko. Yep. So this is an easy one. This was, listen, kudos to, to, to Coach Smith and what he's trying to do here without Cole Anthony, but come on, give me a break. I mean, get, this is nuts. Go ahead. Uh, oh yeah. So I, I think UNC it could be fall into one of those teams, even with Cole Anthony like playing, they, they, they weren't super impressive. I also think Florida could be one of those teams. I mean, when we talked to Eric Fawcett earlier, we, we broke down why Florida might be one of these teams that you can talk about for a Final Four appearance. And they've looked very ordinary on the offensive end. They've been really good defensively, but on the offensive end, they seem to have struggled. So I think those are my two teams that after I opened the gift and I looked at UNC and Florida, I was like, oh man, this is just a scented candle. I'm kind of not down with this present. I'm just going to put this to the side and fake interest on this. Mike, did you have you have a team where you're like faking interest on and you were excited about early on and then you're like, oh man, what? How did this happen? How long you got? <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's okay, let's. let's. <laughs> so you got a lot of these yeah, presents. Let, let's go down the line here. Now, no, what I'll do give, is give us a few. I'll do with these teams that I don't – like they're not as good as the general public thinks they are. Now, listen, I'm going to go the other way on Florida here, not to be contrarian. I was impressed right. how they dismantled Providence. Now, Providence isn't like the worst team in the country, but listen, they have they, – they, they might be the worst team in the Big East. They, they might be the worst team in the Big East. <laughs> but still, right. to dismantle a team with Alpha Diallo on it as they did – and listen, they were the team that beat Nevada last year. So I, right. I, I, I just, they just need some scoring. Nemart's got to give them – you know, give me a 10 game stretch, Andrew, of 16 and 8. That's all I'm looking for. I'm not looking for you to drop 30 points, but someone's got to step forward. You know, otherwise we're just going to be looking at everybody shooting eight. So I'm, I'm not going to say them. I, I, I think they may come around here. Um, you know my thoughts on Arkansas. Okay. I mean, I listen, and that's nine and one. Okay. Nine and one is nine and one, but what, what? Pa- 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 paper tiger? Right? I mean, listen, as I, and I talked to Colin, who, by the way, by the way, guys, I am playing Colin in the fantasy football championship for Action Network. That's the guy I'm playing with. That, that's who I'm going against. You, you, you have to be kidding. Yeah, I am. It's really fun. But, uh, but what, you know, like we talk, <laughs> that's we, we talk about my, I love that you're playing. I love that it's you and Colin. The, yeah, the no, we're excited. Lamar, basketball. just keep running, man. But um, but when he, when he wrote on the clipboard, Muscleman, you know, basket. I mean, like, he's not an X and O right. guy. And I think at some point at, at you know, uh, Mississippi, you know, against Cal, he's going to have to to perform there. Tennessee's been real disappointing. I don't like Barnes. Nobody likes Barnes. Last year had a good year, so he threw me off the scent. I'm going back to it. I think they're very disappointing. I'm not buying them. Carolina, old Roy's in some trouble here. I was talking about this with a friend that we know is a huge old school basketball guy. Roy, you're not as good as Virginia. You're certainly not as good as Duke. And you're not as good as Louisville. So you're number four in the ACC, Roy. That's a tough spot here. So I'm I'm worried about them. 
Outside of that, I mean, I think everything's straightforward. I thought Georgetown was going to be terrible. I'm still out on St. Mary's, but I have to taper tonight because they're beating Arizona State by like 612 points right Destroying now. Destroying so, them. Yeah, Jordan, so Jordan Ford is going Jordan bananas. Jordan Ford is going bananas, you know, which I think he needs to do for them to get to that upper level. That's what I want Nemhart to do, something like that, but tapered down. Like, not, not a, he can't score like Jordan Ford can, but Ford's right, got to right, be right. that guy for them because he makes everything go. So those are the teams I would look at, I, I, I you know. Just disappointed, but hey, we'll see. I'm still betting against Arkansas, guys. Can't wait for SEC play to start. Uh, we hope, listeners, that you don't receive any presents that you unwrap and are like that scented candle that it's just like an awful odor. And you're just like, I'm never going to light this thing. And I, I wish I could just place it somewhere and never think of it again. Uh, let, let's talk some reindeer games. I mean, I, I, my, my last week has been filled with like uh, Christmas songs and carols and all of those things. So, Mike, the best games this thus far this season, and maybe a couple of games you're looking forward to. I think we're still waiting on that like Gonzaga Florida game that we had a few years back uh, out west, uh, and and we're waiting for that like iconic game. We're like, oh man, that that's what college basketball is about. But I, I think maybe a couple of games you could throw out there are the Kansas Dayton game that went to overtime uh, for the championship. I think that was really cool. I think you could throw in the UVA Vermont game because that made UVA kind of sweat it. And we saw how great Anthony Lamb was. And now that kind of put Vermont on a little bit on the national radar. And of course, I think we need to talk about Michigan, Oregon, where Peyton Pritchard just absolutely went off. I mean, watch that game against Michigan and he just, they just ran clear outs. There were no ball screens. There were no pick and rolls. He cooked an unbelievably excellent defensive guard in Xavier Simpson. And, and it, like it was his job. He's one of the best cards in, in the nation, right alongside Powell, right alongside Marcus Howard, right along anybody else you want to bring up as like one of the best cards in the country, Cassius Winston. He's as tough as they come and he backs down from no one and plays fearless. So if we're going to bring up any games that, you know, are the reindeer games that, you know, really paid attention to, I think that the Dayton, uh, Kansas game, UVA Vermont, and of course that Michigan Oregon game that went to overtime where Peyton Pritchard went bananas. And looking ahead, you mentioned Liberty, like the snow squall that is the Liberty. They're playing LSU, who we showed, who showed tonight that they're very vulnerable. That's Sunday, December 29th. I think that's a game to keep an eye on. You want to see how LSU responds after losing to East Tennessee State. And I think Davidson versus Vandy, New Year's Eve where you got two of the best shooters in the nation. We already said about Naismith, and you got Kellen Grady on Davidson's side, so I think that's worth paying attention to, too. Mike, what about reindeer games? You got a best game that you've seen in the game you're looking forward to? What reindeer games are you playing over? Well, the Gonzaga-Oregon game was absolutely amazing. Both teams playing at a high level, back and forth, shot making. Everything was fantastic. Um, the the BYU-Kansas game for three quarters of that game without Yoeli Childs was at an extremely, extremely high level. I thought that was an amazing game. All the games that occurred down there were, were fantastic. And then, of course, Dayton was amazing as well with Kansas. So those are the ones that jumped off the page at me. Like I said, I can't wait to get into conference play because I want to see some of these top teams go back at each other. Kudos to Virginia for what they've been able to do as well. They're not exciting, but certainly seeing them against the Duke and seeing them against Louisville is going to be very exciting as well. Uh, all right, Mike. I think we need to go a little personnel here. We need to go a little. Let, let, let's let's let let's bring back the curtain a tiny bit. Number one, Mike. What snack are you having during the podcast this evening? I think we need to let listeners in on this because this is a, when when I saw the visual of this, it was amazing. It blew my mind. Yeah, these are mismatched sandwich creams. Okay, delicious cane sugar frosting sandwich between chocolate and vanilla flavored cookie. They look and sound amazing. <laughs> if, you, if you're looking for a holiday snack, I think you need to grab one of those. And I just like to tell a story. We During the snow squall, we've had some like winter weather here on the East Coast. Uh, so we lost, uh, my house lost power uh, last yesterday. And I was trying to pull together a podcast, uh, the interview with Jeff Nadu. And I, I was trying to record an intro. And so what I had was literally candles and a headlamp on trying to edit the podcast to get it out and get it out to the listeners. And it was just like this, like, what am I even doing? I feel like I, 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 I'm not even sure like why this is happening during the holiday season. All I want to do is just put out this nice conversation that we had with Jeff and it turned into like this unbelievable experience. So uh, listeners, we just want to share the grind that we try to give you, uh, you know, some quality college basketball talk. 
It's not that easy all the time with no power and trying to get a podcast edited. That thing is t- that's that's a tough job to do over here. I, again, had a headlamp and candles on, and then my girls still had to take showers in, in the dark. So that was a whole other thing we had to figure out too. It was crazy. Absolutely, people don't understand what goes on the podcast. Throw us a review, will you, please? I mean, come on. If nothing else, just for that. I mean, the hustle the hustle behind that. That was that was bananas. All right, listeners, thank you so much for tuning into the Screen to Screen College Basketball Podcast. We're happy to keep you company on your commute and get you ready for whatever college basketball game you're going to be viewing. It's gone. It, it's almost final. I mean, Gonzaga's put up, going to put up 100 on North Carolina. If you took the over, I think that's a great move. And if you're looking forward to some weekend games, we, we hope that you enjoy the weekend games. And there's a ton of great matchups to look forward to. We want to wish you guys happy holidays and girls happy holidays. Happy holidays to you and your families. Hope that you guys get everything you want. Hope everybody uses uh, recycled wrapping paper. And uh, we hope that, uh, you know, your cleanup goes pretty smooth because we know sometimes the worst part of the the holidays is the cleanup afterwards. So we hope the cleanup goes pretty smooth, but everybody has some smiles and gets everything they want. Mike, anything else for listeners out there? St. Mary's won by 40. They shot 16 of 26 from three-point range. (laughs) That's a stocking 62% right from three-point range. Jordan Ford at 34, 7 of 11. Uh, talk about All-America right there. I, that, that, sound, that sounds about right. I mean, I mean, is that what we're talking about here? <laughs> well, we're certainly talking about practice, with, as I would say, with Arizona State. That's what we're talking about. Practice. Uh, def- defensive drills. Start them up. Let's go. <laughs> All right, listeners. We will catch up with you before you know. We have a couple of uh, we have a couple of things coming up later on this week, so we'll get that out to you into your ears for the holiday season and all of your little chores that you're going to do. Thanks for letting us keep you company on whatever uh, commute with, that we're uh, keeping you company on, and uh, we'll catch up with you before you know it. Cheers, salam, and grazie, grazie, arigato.